So I turn to uh, Jean-Claude Meyer. You have the floor, and uh, you are very complimentary with all what has been said already. So please, Jean-Claude. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Merci, Jean-Claude. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the future of the financial markets. Uh, three years ago at the WPC in Rabat, I was very pessimistic, maybe too much according to Jean-Claude at that time, uh, as we were at the end of a long 10-year uh, cycle of growth, remembering then the paradox of Minsky, when things seem to go well, it means that crisis is roaring. I anticipate then two scenarios, a soft landing, one which was good, and or a crash in 2020. A crash happened, but for reasons, unfortunately, which I did not expect. Today, in the pandemic context, the situation is, of course, totally different. We are at a crossroad with a lot of uncertainty, <clears throat> but there is a consensus, almost a cliche. The global recovery is on its way, but the moving markets face the risks of inflation and higher interest rates. I must say this year, I follow this cliche with the risk of not being original, but hopefully right. Recovery, as you said, Serge, is on its way, if we are not, if, even if we are not yet out of the woods. World growth should be of 6% this year, roughly in the world, in Europe, 4.3%, in the US, 6.2%, and in the world, 4.5% next year, which is extraordinary. This recovery has been fueled by social measures of the governments and the huge flows of liquidities of all central banks. And we fear now a tapering, which could lead to a rise of interest rates. In the US, Jay Powell has just succeeded to announce a later gradual tapering in November, maybe, or in December until 2023, without provoking a panic market as it was the case in 2013. The Fed will continue to maintain its monthly $100 billion asset program until the US reaches a 2% inflation and maximum employment, emphasizing that tapering would not lead automatically to rising, to raising interest rates. In Europe, ECB said it would slowly, but uh, buy fewer bonds in the future and move to a moderately lower pace in its 80 billion a month emerg uh, uh, pandemic emerg emergency purchase program, PEPP. The lady is in tapering, said Christine Lagarde until probably March next year. Overeating and inflation are threatening. As the Fed has shifted its stance to give more leeway to inflation and greater priority to employment. A risk of overeating, yes, but which can be transitory, according to Jay Powell. The risk. Inflation has reached, as we all know, 5% in the US and 3% in Europe, and risks are there for various reasons. First, wages could increase because of a long boom of a Chinese workforce now being aging. Second, oil and natural gas prices are up, maybe for a long time. Third, a large overrank of private savings is waiting to be spent. Fourth, near zero interest rates feed the bubble of the stock markets, exceptional monetary growth, huge fiscal deficits. Fifth, population is getting older with consumers, baby boomers, increasing demand and less productive labor force. Sixth, we must point out that the Central Bank of Norway has just increased by 0.25% its rates projecting 
a 1.5% interest rate in the next year. This gives a trend and a turn, maybe, alongside with Norway, followed by Pakistan, Hungary, Brazil, and Paraguay. U.S. Treasury bonds last week has just gone from 1.3% to 1.5%. But inflation could be indeed transitory. Only 235,000 jobs were created in the U.S. in August versus 750,000 expected uh, with a still a nearly 6 million unemployed people. And, um, and wages have increased by 4.3% less than inflation. And inflation in August in the U.S. has been limited to 0.3%. But if unemployment falls, wages will increase. Consumption as well, leading to inflation, raise of interest rates, and a shock on the market, of course. Transitory also, because automation could replace partially the Chinese labor force. The present inflation is driven not by tightening demand, but by a shutdown of offer, as we all know, particularly of goods having run into temporary bottlenecks, as in logistics, timber, semiconductors, etc., and by a rise of uh, raw materials. Fortunately, if we can say so, Delta is slowing the recovery and might favor a more cautious attitude from the Fed. If this transit transitory inflation remains controlled, interest rates will remain low, maybe for the next 10 years, according to Olivier Blanchard, and thus stock markets could remain healthy. Inflation worrying in June is not so important if compared to a year before, which was depressed because of a crisis and is just rising because the economy is emerging from the deep freeze. I personally totally disagree with Larry Summers, who believes that we live in a recipe for disaster, leading to hyperinflation. And I disagree also with Noriel Rubini, who anticipates a stagflation. No hyperinflation, no stagflation. Financial markets, as we all know, are a consequence of growth inflation, employment level, and interest rates, which have led to a certain bubble of assets, shares, real estate, art, but could make us rather optimistic. A certain bubble, yes. Indeed, global equities are now at very high valuations according to the Schiller cyclically adjusted ratio of price earnings. American stocks are valued at a multiple of 22 versus European stocks at 17. This important decoupling might shrink in the future to the advantage of European stocks. Several fund managers fear that stocks are running too hot and that we are at the top of a bubble. In fact, there is no doubt a certain bubble as S&P 500 is 30% above the level of February 2020, and NASDAQ 50% above. All depends on prospects for corporate earnings, for inflation and interest rates. If corporate profits remain strong and interest rates low, stock prices look reasonable. The big question is whether interest rates will jump, how soon and how much. Stocks, as we know, are sensitive to the level of bond yields, with low yields making, of course, equities more attractive, and the only investment. For the time being, there is no alternative, TNA. But risks are still there. A new wave of the virus, high volatility of the market, leading to a possible overreaction. A financial crisis in China already 1 trillion and 700 have been wiped off uh, recently in the Chinese stock market, particularly in the internet and the real estate sector. A war on the Chinese waters because of Taiwan, uh, 
and other geopolitical risks. A collapse of some shares due to environmental concerns. A split of U.S. internet companies due to interest measures. A crisis on some sovereign debts if interest rates rise a lot. But I am rather confident on the stock markets for the following reasons. Above all, as higher interest rates should regularly but slowly increase in the future in a moderate way. As buybacks are increasing now, $500 billion expected during the second half of this year, favoring shareholders over debt holders. As mergers and acquisitions are booming thanks to cheap long-term financing. And as the level of employment is still lower than before the crisis, and as we know, for the timing at least, as investors buy the dip. To conclude, thanks to a robust growth, moderate inflation, and interest rates rising slowly, and thanks to a continuous good fine-tuning of, of the central banks, I expect no boom, no a crash, bumpy markets with ups and downs every day, as it, as it is the case, as it was the case this week, which was not good. In brief, next year, a slow increase of the markets or plateauing gently, but we are at the crossroad and we should remain careful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, <laughs> I said uh, the complementary uh, expositions uh, are so useful for all of us. So, uh, but I found, as you said, that you are much more optimistic. <laughs> optimistic, maybe reasonable. No, of course, remaining reasonable and calling for vigilance in any case. But, uh, but very interesting and stimulating. Thank you.